dear facebook pure urology viewers good evening one and all i hope all of you are safe both in india and abroad as every day we are conducting this surgical technique program uh, based on the surgical technique each one each day one surgical technique as you all know uh, in pcnl there is something every time we listen we learn because there is some component of blindness there is some component of blindness because if you are not using ultrasound it is more so so majority of the indians use cm they have various uh, techniques like 0 degree 30 degree bull's eye inferior calyx middle calyx upper calyx today actually i invited dr and professor shibbar sir who is a uh, urology society of india past president last 5 years i have been seeing sir somewhere in gym in the morning when i am in the usa conference and uh, morning in the main hall presenting something and afternoon chatting with so many juniors and then evening again in the party again with the uh, jovial nature that is what i remembered 5 years back except that i don't did not know then as i started attending the uh, lectures what i realized is whenever there is some discussion going on some people talk only few basic concepts how we can get out sir also knows about rirs i have listened one time pcnl versus rirs he was clearly mentioning what is the advantage and disadvantage just not saying that this is bad or this is good that is the second phase i observed that uh, such a senior is very uh, clear when he is talking then i came to know very uh, from the uh, people like uh, madhusudan agarwal sir sabni sir and uh, senior urologists who we consider as uh, pioneers in uh, because we are batch of after 2006 mch after that we realized that uh, their gurus are like uh, uh, chibbar sir and all that because they have learned not from indians they have learned from abroad and they went there learned the technique and came back here and established in big cities way back as i mentioned 30 years sir was just mentioning it is 38 years back number in 1983 so it is a long journey 38 years sir is still practicing very actively uh, very few uh, more than uh, 7, 65 70 years are academically active like dr mahesh deshai sir chibbar sir pb singh sir they are keen what is the topic what i am uh, going to talk and where for whom everything they inquired before giving the talk before we go to the session i like to interact like every day what we are interacting good evening sir chibbar sir uh, good evening. Welcome. thank you for accepting this invitation before i introduce you formally i want to ask you you are you belongs to which batch mch and where, where is your mch or your urology training is done sir my m uh, my mch in general surgery is 1975 sir when i was abroad and i did my entire urological training in edinburgh in in the uk sir. and i came back and i did my mnams in those days there was no dnb yes sir yes sir i did my mnams and when i joined uh, jj hospital as a young uh, assistant uh, Honorary, assistant honorary urologist. This is in which year, sir? 1982. 1982. In that year, what was the endo urology equipment available? Anything, if at all? In 1982, there was lower track endo urology, nothing the else. TRP was there, sir? TRP was there, yes. Okay. TRP was there. So, all stones in the kidney used to be do done by open surgery. By entirely being done by open surgery. Uh, sir, when you do pyelolithotomy for staggorn, by chance if you are not doing anatrophic, uh, by chance if you are not doing anatrophic and multiple stones in the kidney, uh, wa what were the instruments available, what are the incision in the pelvis at that time used to give? I was never very fond of the Boyce's anatrophic. I used to do a Gilles Vernet. Sir. I was trained in Gilles Vernet in Edinburgh. My teacher was... Uh, Jeff Chisholm, who was an expert at doing a good Gilles Bernay. I'd also been to Europe and seen Gilles Bernay himself. 
So uh, Jill Verne technique was my preferred choice for doing staghorns in the days before PCNL. Sure. But when I was there, I was training in uh, urology in the UK in 78, 79, 80. Yes, At that sir. time, your PCNL had just about started. John Wickham was doing PCNLs in the UK, very early days, very, very early days. And I just had the opportunity of seeing him once do it. And I came back because I, my training was over and I came back to Mumbai. But I was, I was, my one foot was already there. I said, no, I've got to go back. And PCNL is something that's going to pick up like nobody's business. So yes. within a short time in 1983, I went back. I spent time with John Wickham Sorry. and I trained with PCNL. And on his advice, I went to and New York. In 1983, when you went back, is it ultrasound based or CM based? CM based, entirely CM based. I was, is it? Yes, entirely CM based. So, they, they, what point they were struggling, if you remember carefully, sir? I'll talk about that in my, yeah, in no, my talk. Okay. You'll get an no, idea. After coming they back. were not struggling at all. They were doing a very, very good job. There was no struggling at all. And I'll tell you exactly what was going on. Uh, there was no sonography. I was introduced to sonography much later as a method of doing PCNs, for putting PCN nephrostomies in patients with uh, hydronephrosis and requiring PCNs. So I think, uh, as Mahesh has often mentioned, that no urologist today should be without experience at ultrasound. Yes, Every urologist should have excellent experience because there is the, the ultrasound is an excellent tool in the hands of a urologist. Yes, so there, there is no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. So I, 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 one should do that. But uh, at PCNLs, I still am completely happy with using fluoroscopy alone. I don't use an ultrasound at all, except when I have a trouble you know, pacifying the system on very, very rare occasions, very rare occasions. I have access to ultrasound, remember that. It's not as if I don't have an access. So at that time, the dilatation was up to 30 French, sir? Yes, when we started, it was 30 French. And as a matter of fact, when I was in, in, in the UK, uh, one of my uh, colleagues, a junior colleague, called Ron Miller, he had devised what we call the Miller, Wickham Miller forceps. I don't know if you've ever, have you seen the Wickham Miller forceps? No, sir. No, it's sir. an endoscopic forceps, which got three huge prongs. Sure. The telescopes to the center of it, and we would catch one centimeter stones, actually catch them and wiggle them out intact, one centimeter stones intact yeah. to the parenchyma. I shudder what must be happening to the parenchyma as we drew them out. Yes, so, of course, those were the early days. This was, and then very soon, of course, that instrument became obsolete. And uh, now uh, we are going smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Sorry, this smaller and smaller and smaller. When did you, this is a, I want an honest answer because unlearning is a big process. Sometimes I remember in 2007, Tak SK Paul sir used to say that 30 French, I don't have any problem. After 2010, Sarah also told that, okay, there is a role of mini pair. He was a strong proponent. Even when we used to go to Nadia, he used to argue that no problem. If the puncture is good, 30 French is no problem. When did you um, change your mind and went to mini park? In the last uh, decade, when, when did you change? When did you change? Round about in 1990-91, on numerous occasions, I would do a dilatation and put a ureteroscope in. Yeah, okay. And do the PCN with a ureteroscope. It was very inconvenient because you were one mile away oh. from the patient. Yes. But I had to do that because at that time there was still no PCN set instruments available. Okay. And I had made up my mind that this is the way to go. You must miniaturize. Oh. One thing I've learned in, in any kind of science be skeptical of what you are doing at every stage that you're doing it. Sir. Be skeptical. There is nothing like truth. The truth is evasive. Yes, sir. There's no truth. There's no absolute truth. Yeah. The truth is evasive. That's a and great you to, uh, Yes, so you have to search all the time. So, I mean, if you are doubting what you are doing, then you look for better ways of doing whatever it is that you're doing. Yes. So that's so you, that do now, you do now, depending on the size stone, 12 French yes. to 20 French. I, yes, um, 20, 22 French, up to 22 French, I will uh, go uh, for the, uh, for even a larger stone. Yes, sir. So for now that uh, this introduction, more than 50 people have joined and uh, they will be keep joining and uh, 
uh, more than 60 have joined so i will introduce formally dr yes. chipper sir right. Uh, right. who is a marathon uh, runner come <laughs> marathon uh, uh, surgeon great sir uh, there is a long uh, way to go and a lot of the juniors will learn from sir the uh, actually a uh, lot of the seniors uh, have learned from him which we uh, we see as seniors he is a teacher of teachers there is no doubt he served very coolly his uh, president uh, duty also even the last day when the discussion was going on most of the answers without any hesitation without any stress on his face i i remember the agm of the sirs it went uh, <laughs> it went smoothly without much uh, uh, much uh, confusion on in his face that is the that is the main thing everybody remembers from percy jol chibber sir he is consultant urologist in two three hospitals in mumbai as sir was mentioning for last 39 years he pointed in the practice and teaching of pcnl urethroscopy and laparoscopy urology in india very few have picked up all maybe the need of the hour in mumbai at that time because in mumbai uh, is one of the happening city one has to be well versed with the, all the procedures he also underwent training in the technique of uh, pcn and uh, radiology at the institute of urology london uk and he is the president of the urology society of india and past president of the west zone chapter of the usi director of the laparoscopic training at johnson johnson course in mumbai that is also a uh, very very important part of his career that learning laparoscopy apart from excellent endoscopic surgeon is also challenging in the in their uh, part of the training because not much uh, teaching is available the way now youtube internet everything you type you will see it that time only you have to go personally observe quickly learn and patients may not be there that much then he is also honored with various awards for his remarkable contribution in the healthcare industry four gold medals for standing first in the university of mumbai in the for ms gold medal for standing first in the fcps examination absolutely great sir we are very uh, at least i am very big fan of you for uh, two reasons one thing is cool calm nature second thing is whenever the discussion happens you keep your discussion very broad minded you accept the junior senior and you listen and then you answer crisp everybody respects that we all remember in the conferences with this introduction i thank once again sir and i will hand over the program to sir thank you very much sir thank you very much can i have my uh, yes, screen share screen share press share screen yes sir there we are right now as i was uh, as uh, chandramohan was telling you i started doing pcns in 1983 at that time there weren't very many people as a matter of fact i can remember almost on the hand, i mean on the fingers of one hand for the number of people doing pcn at that time uh sir i cannot the, the screens yeah, the first button, button first button will be problem you roll and then click sir first time when you do it uh -huh. just roll and then click down Uh, you click on the presentation two times and then roll. Okay, yeah. that's all. What do we consider as a ideal PCNL today? The puncture should be perfect. When I will talk about a perfect puncture soon, the dilatation should be minimal. Now that is a very very important aspect. There is a concept of uh, the principle of diminishing returns. as you make a procedure more and more difficult to make it better for the patient there comes a time when the returns are not as good so exactly. you you reduce the dilatation to a minimum till you are able to do the procedure perfectly satisfactory and you have reduced the complication and the cosmesis to the any more reduction is not going to add to the cosmesis or to the uh, result then there is no point in miniaturizing any further so that's a very important point of miniaturization you can't go on miniaturizing for miniaturizing sake okay yes sir minimum number of tracks i remember in the old days it was proudly some people would say i've made five tracks i made six tracks i made seven tracks i don't think even even in those days i never made more than three tracks and now i make it a point never to make more than two tracks yes sir try your level best no operative bleeding if your punctures are perfect there'll be no operative bleeding if your punctures are perfect and there's no operative bleeding 
regardless of the size of your track, there is no need of a tube. Provided there are no stones left or whatever stones are left, you have chosen that we will pass through a DJ's tent if they're very, very small fragments. Sure. And in that situation, if the DJ is in place, you have put no tube, then certainly the patient can go home the next morning. Now, this was my ideal piece. And how often do I manage to achieve this these days in the last few years? I would say about 70 to 80 percent. So 70 to 80 percent of my PCNLs will go home the next day, sure. next day, including with people with larger stones as minus three, ten, three centimeters or four centimeters. Yes. Sir. Now, PCNLs are now divided into two categories. Those are for larger stones and those for smaller stones. So everybody will agree that a stone larger than 2.5 centimeters, there are good, I mean, like Chandramohan, who will extend the RIRS to three centimeters or even more, no, no, but most okay, people will say 2.5 centimeters the limit of RIRS and anything larger than 2.5 centimeters or even a staghorn, a PCNL is an absolute indication. Yes, For smaller stones, less than 2.5 centimeters, I would say it's an alternative to RIRS for two reasons. One, because you don't have the instrument or the expertise to do RIRS. That's a perfectly valid reason and you can do uh, PCNL. PCNL is definitely a cheaper method. Instruments are not expensive. And uh, the second reason might be when you want complete clearance of the stone is mandatory, such as a patient who is whose job depends on complete clearance as a pilot or a person who's going on shape or something, the more you keep him away from job, he's going to lose thousands in loss of income. So these are the indications for doing a mini PCNL for anybody, okay? Sure. Right. Now, let's talk about PCNL. The general procedure is divided into these five steps. The position of the patient, the access, how you do access, what is the method of doing access, how you do dilatation, how you do nephroscopy and fragmentation, and are there any ancillary procedures? Ancillary procedures which may be synchronous or metachronous. By synchronous, I mean, do the ancillary procedure at the same time as you're doing the PCNL or ancillary procedure which you can do later on, okay? Yes. So, now, first thing you do is a pre-placed uretric access. Everybody knows that. But once in a while, you usually leave the pre-placed uretric access to your houseman or whoever it is. And therefore, it's very important to get a technique established. Six French uretary catheter, guide wire, and put this. Always use a guide wire. You can put a uretary catheter very easily without a guide wire. But let your juniors put it with a guide wire. Yes. Because sometimes they will ruin the U. And by the time you come, no uretary catheter can be passed. And then you have to go ahead and either puncture the stone directly with a chiba needle. Yes. I'll talk about that. So you can opacify and then go on and do the procedure. Or you need USG to main, gain access to the system without any dilatation. Remember, because you've not got a uretic catheter inside. Yes. So sometimes this happens. There's no need of abandoning the procedure. You go ahead and use the chiba. That's my preferred method of using a chiba for the stone directly. Yeah. Okay. The position. Uh, Position is fully prone for almost 95% of my cases. I'm not saying that supine PCNL does not have indication. It certainly does, and we'll come to that soon or later. Yes. But prone in almost all cases, no tilt to the patient. Patient lies completely flat. Bolsters as required by the anesthetist. I usually prefer horizontal bolsters, but sometimes I put vertical bolsters. The patient is very obese. Break the table. Here you can see the table is broken nicely so that you get a flat patient. Your back should not be arched so that the ribs are coming close to the iliac crest. So you must break the table and see this table. It's a marvelous table, which allows unhampered access to the entire area from here, from where the kidneys are, all the way to the pelvis, what my CM to be underneath. You may not get a, a, a table like this. And if you do not get a table like this, you have to make sure that your arrangements are right. You, you may need to put the foot end of the uh, tape on an, on an extension, but make sure that your CRM has good movement before you start doing the PCNL. There's no point in then realizing that CRM won't reach either the kidney properly or won't reach down. So always have access proper. 
Right. Now, access. This is perhaps the most important part of the PCN, and therefore I'm going to take a little extra time on this, and yes, I'm going to go a bit slow on this, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. The imaging for access is either C-arm fluoroscopy. Advan disadvantage is that their radiation is involved, and therefore you should take radiation safety measures. And also remember that the C-arm is a two-dimensional image. At any given time, you are seeing X and Y. You're not seeing the depth. So you need to correct for the depth. And therefore, that's all you need to know. Ultrasound is excellent. Remember that even ultrasound is now three-dimensional. It is two-dimensional at any given time. But because you have control over the two dimensions in your hand, yeah. the plane at which you're screening is in your hand. So you can you can play with it, you can tilt it one way or another and across numerous dimensions. So you the basic trick on ultrasound is to bring the target, your needle, all in one plane. If they're not in one plane, you initially you may find that difficult to do, and you, you may you may need a needle guide, but ultimately you want to do free arm ultrasound where you you're putting your needle into the same plane as your ultrasound probe without the help of an ultrasound guide. Both yes, techniques are superb, but basically you have to understand that both need a correction for, uh, for getting a three-dimensional view. Of course, the advantage of ultrasound is you, you, can go, you can ultrasound for an hour and you have not caused any harm to the patient. Okay. Yes, now, choosing the calyx, that's a very important thing. Either you choose the calyx or you choose the stone. If the calyx of choice is occupied by a stone, then I will not opacify that kidney. I will go straight for the stone. Okay. Okay. Now, understand these basic principles of access. The upper pole will give you access to the pelvis, the ureter, and almost all the lower pole calyces. It's like entering the room from the chimney. Yes, so sir. as you enter the room from the chimney, you can see all three rooms that is the lower, lower pole. If you come from the middle pole, you will, of course, be able to see the middle pole. You will be able to go into the pelvis. You may be able to go into the lower pole, but generally the inferior lower pole and the anterior lower pole. You will not be able to see the posterior lower pole calyx because you're coming from posterior. You can't go back posterior. Yes. To the so you understand that? You understand these? Same three chimney dimensions. to other same three chimney, dimensions. we cannot go. Yeah. Okay. From the lower pole, if you enter, you will be able to see, generally the lower pole is dilated when you have stones. So you may be able to access all three lower pole unless it's completely undilated when you may not be able to access the uh, anterior lower pole carrying. May not, but generally you can. You'll be able to access the pelvis and you may be able to go up to the upper pole, but not so all will, the calyces is in the upper pole. Uh, I will interrupt, sir, here. Yes. So, uh, you, the re, the, the, this slide is very, very important. Very few mention this point that upper pole has so much advantage. Even there is a large stone burden, you mean to say that the upper pole can clear all these stones with one dilatation probably? Absolutely, absolutely, except in the middle pole calyces. Yes. And there are ways of tackling the middle pole without having access to another tract also. We can do that. So in that case, supracostal puncture may be required, you will not hesitate to do that. I will never hesitate to do even a supra 12 puncture at any time. Right. At any right. time. Okay. Yes, okay sir. Next I will come to that soon. Yeah. Right. Now that having chosen this, now the next point is extremely important for the safety of your patients. That your puncture will be transpapillary. Now what do I mean by that? This is your landing zone. Imagine that the collecting system is like a glove and the fingers of the glove are attached to the papilla. That's the one place they are firmly attached. As you leave the papilla, they are not firmly attached. There is fat in this area, which is the sinus plane. You understand? Yes, so if you go through the papilla, you have a firm adhesion of your, of your sheet and the collecting system. There's no leakage. It's a watertight system. Okay. Yes, Secondly, all the blood vessels here are vasa recti. You are not going to go through any major vessel. Yes. It's perfectly safe. And if you've entered this way, 100% you can do a tubeless PCNL. Yes, sir. 
100 percent yes now if you don't if you enter here that is this is your landing zone but you have entered in the infundibulum now you're entering the plane where there's loose areolar tissue so this collecting system will move inwards and you will get a pocket and you will find a lot of problems occurring besides the fact that and so water will collect and your view may not be ideal more importantly arteries are in this area and you can easily cause arterial injury in this area you from within remember the veins are very close to the infundibulum this is a point of anatomy which is very important veins are very close to the infundibulum and you can injure the veins from within especially if you over dilate an infundibulum you will tear the veins and you will get torrential bleeding but nothing to worry about that this is venous bleeding and the pressure in the veins is never very high but if you go from outside and if you haven't done a proper landing that is through the papilla and you've gone outside the papilla you've got large interloba arteries and that can cause and give rise to arterial bleeding which is highly dangerous so for those reasons Transpapillary puncture is God's word in PCNL. It's the most important principle of PCNL, of safe PCNL. Okay. Now, as I was telling uh, Chandra Mohan earlier, yes, these are my three gurus. I spend most of my time with this gentleman. His name is John Wickham. Unfortunately, he's no more. He died. Uh, how come? Uh, how come you got an uh, introduction to him, sir? That is more important. <laughs> I life is a connection. Somebody I had met with him when I was, I did my training in Edinburgh, as I told you. And I had to travel through the length and breadth of UK to watch people who were doing a good job. And I used to watch John Wickham doing his PCNLs or attempting to do those were very early days. It yeah, was, yeah. He was learning uh, just as, we, and at that time I had, you know, made, suck up friendship with him. And when I, I told you, I went back again in 1983 Sorry. to learn PCNL from him. Yes, then yes. on his advice, I went to Arthur Smith in New York and I learned some PCN from him. And I'd also, I'd met with Peter Alkin before, but more importantly, I got to know Peter Alkin's. Now, John Wickham never did his punctures. His punctures were done by a guy called Mike Kellett, who was an excellent, uh, excellent uh, radiologist. And Peter Alkin, although he did his punctures later on, at those days, Rolf Gunter used to do his punctures. And I got to know Rolf Gunter as well. Rolf Gunter came to Bombay some years later. And what I learned from him was immeasurable. He, he was an excellent, excellent interventional radiologist. Great. Arthur Smith also didn't do his punctures until later. Those days he used to get radiologists to do his punctures. He was very unhappy with the radiologists because invariably they were making punctures in the wrong place and he was cursing. So he also got into the habit of doing his own puncture later on. But the man whom I would really credit with excellence was this man's radiologist, Rolf Gunther, superb man. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what is the radiological equipment? What did, I mean, how did I start doing PCNLs? This is what I had for the first five years of my PCNLs. I did my PCNLs in the radiology suite, not in the OR. There was no CRM. We had no CRM in those days. Okay. And <clears throat> this is, so the patient lay on this there was no way of giving position remember that yeah. you could put the bolsters but there was no way of breaking this table yeah. okay and uh, this was a rigid thing so there was no need of there was no way of getting a c put there was no need of getting a second plane you only had to work in one plane and the way i had seen rolf gunter and mike keller do it invariably they never chose a second plane they would always do it in one plane alone and how did they do it? I'll tell you. Now I come to the principle. So for the early five, first five or six years, this is how I did my punctures. I would put a needle across the kidney in the lie that I wanted my puncture to take place. Okay. And then I would choose a point on the skin. I'll tell you now. There. Sir, that, that, that point skin is definitely intellect, sir, that is. Yeah, I use a point on the skin. Just a minute, I get back because it's not allowing me to... Wait a minute. No problem. Yeah. Where did it go? Oh God, where did it go? No, no problem, sir. Restart the PowerPoint. Share screen. Okay. No problem. Sorry. Share screen, sir. No problem. Share screen and uh, yeah. you will go back to same place. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Enlarge the view, sir. Yeah. You're right. 
Right, sir. Yeah, that's it. So I've got this scrubber, and that will show you. Yes, sir. See, I put my needle across. Yes. And then that's the midline. That's the back. Yes. I'm putting a hand's breadth. Okay. And one, two, or three fingers lateral. Yes. One finger if the patient is very thin. Two yeah. fingers if the moderate, and three fingers if the chubby fat patient. Yes. Yes. If you did that and you put your needle point there and put your knife point there, then your needle will almost always go at about 45 degrees yeah. to the kidney. So now you advance your needle. Where am I going? Yes, sir. You advance your needle. You put your. You make the point. You make your puncture. Sir. Right now you put your needle at 45 degrees, and this is important. Now I'm going to the kidney and I'm jiggling the kidney. Yeah. Watch this. Again, my thing's gone busy. Yes, yes, it's playing, sir. No, it's not. Ah, there. It's playing, playing. You see this? Yes, sir. Now. I've used the chiba needle. Can you see a chiba needle? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm chiba. jiggling the kidney, yes, but yes, I can yes. make out there is a there is a plane between the parenchyma between the stone and the needle. So yes. I know I'm exactly in the same spot. I'm able to move my kidney. Yes, and sir. See that? And now I put a chiba needle through. Yeah. Now I started using a chiba needle in those days because supposing I didn't get into the collecting system, I might have to make a second puncture and a third puncture. So I wanted to minimize the puncture by using a 22 gauge needle. So this is a chiba needle that is going through the IP needle. You get my point? Yes, yes. Yeah. That chiba needle, you will get water. Yes, from in this case, I'll get a feeling of the stone. Stone, stone. Uh, down yes. the stone. Yeah, but if there is no stone, if there is a collecting system, I will that get. If will you hit the stone, will, you will thread over that chiba needle. You are IP needle. Yeah, IP needle. Absolutely right. So that's exactly yeah. what I'm going to do now. Yeah. So I'll do this. Now I put the needle in, and now I'm putting the guide wire. Okay, right. simple. So that was my technique for doing PCNLs almost for the first four or five years. I've never needed to tilt the patient or tilt. Uh, I didn't have a ability to tilt the CR. Yeah. Then somewhere in, I can't remember the exact time. You can ask Dr. Janak Desa, he will tell you. That time the lithotripers were coming in and Ahmedabad, where Janak Desa used to work, he got himself a lithostar one. This is a lithostar 2. I tried to get a lithostar 1 from the web. I couldn't find one. The only thing that was available on the web, uh, the image, was the lithostar 2. So it's not the original thing that Janak was using. Now, Janak Desai started doing lithotripsies, and he had a large number of stones which were obviously not treatable by lithotripsy. So he had to do PCNLs. So he invited me to come to Ahmedabad and help him. So I must have gone for numerous weekends in one Saturday, Sunday spell, we would do somewhere around 10 to 15 PCNLs in one weekend. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, this was the equipment that Janak had, nothing else. So the PCNL had to be done on this table. Okay. There was no CM. There was no CM. You only had this equipment. So I said, simple, we can do it. Why? Because if you do a, P a lithotripsy, sir. remember that when you see the stone in the AP view, yeah. Your crosshair and the stone is available. And you can see the stone and that crosshair. But the stone may be, so you have two axes. You have the X axis and the, I mean, the X axis and the Y axis, right? Okay. But you don't know where the stone is in the Z axis. The Z axis is the vertical axis, right? So what you do is now you put the image two, that is this, this the arm. You get it? Wait a minute, my. Yeah, you use this tube. And in this tube, you will find that the stone is either above or below your crosshairs. And you move the table up or down until the stone comes on the crosshairs. And that's how you give lithotripsy. Anybody knows that's the way to give lithotripsy. Yes, sir. So I use the same technique for opacity, for access at PCNL. So what I would do is simple. You see the stone in the AP position. Sir. And if you are not happy, you put your needle where the stone is, where you think where the stone is in your AP direction, yeah. and you aspirate and you find no urine. Yes. So then you are obviously not in the right plane. 
Yes. You are either posterior to that collect to the target or you are anterior to the target. Am I right? Yes. Posterior to the target means towards the roof, and anterior to the target means For the floor. towards the floor. Okay. Yes, now watch this image. This is your what you are seeing on IITV. Yeah. Okay. This is your target. The yellow thing is the target. Yes. Your needle can be either at this, which is optimal. It yeah. can be posterior or it can yeah. be anterior. Yes. All three will look like this on your yes. on your image intensifier in the AP view. Zero degree. Zero degree. They all look like this, so you can't make out. So what you do now is to tilt the CM towards the foot. This is the foot. This is the head. Okay. Yes. You tilt the CM towards the foot, and now what happens? See, what is what is posterior goes to the top end of the tube. Yeah. What is anterior goes to the bottom at the end of the tube. So it's actually very, very intuitive. All you do is take out the needle and poke it, change the direction and go into the into the correct correct point. So, if however you go in this direction, yes, then it becomes counterintuitive. Yes. Because what is uh, posterior is now lying at the bottom, which is at the bottom of your tube. Yes. So your your movements are counterintuitive. Sorry. Why do I show you both? Because it all depends on what is your situation. If your pillar is in the wrong place, yeah. you, your TV man will say, "Sir, me piche nahi kar sakta hu. Yes. Pillar bich me aata hai. I can only go above." Yes. So where he has to put the tube, you will not have a access. Sometimes you will have to go above. Sometimes you will have to go below. So you should know how to go in both planes. Sir, a, a point to mention, sir. uh you you move the kidney during the zero degree so that you are nearer to the stone first yes. of all yes so that you will go 10 to 15 degrees only you can miss yes exactly that 10 to 15 degrees you see in the other angle and then recorrect it absolutely that's perfect and the advantage of this is this is not in the way of my needle the yes. the the iitv does not come in the same line as my needle so my hands do not get radiated yeah. my hands are away from radiation very important point you'll see that yes sir. okay so now then somewhere around the line when i was to teach a lot of people i remember i used to have been to nadiad first for a long uh, workshop and i presented my cases there and a lot of people came up to me and said sir what is this bulza you're not teaching us the bulza technique Yeah. I said, frankly, my dear chap, I don't even know what the bullseye is. Yes. I've never read about this bullseye. That was the time I went to the books and started reading about the bullseye, and I saw what the bullseye is. So I'm now I'm going to tell you about the bullseye and my technique, which is the biplanar technique. Yeah. Doctor Janak Desai today, even today, he's an excellent puncture, uh, uh, an excellent person who does a PCN so effectively. He uses my biplanar technique almost all the time. Yeah, you've seen Janak operating anywhere. He will use this biplanar technique. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what is the bullseye technique? It's relatively simple. Now, first you do uh, in zero degree. That's P A view, and this is what the calyx looks like, right? Now you take your needle, and you you tilt the C arm in the thirty degrees, so that now you can see that this is the thirty degree tilt, and you see the calyx that you want to enter. Yes. you put your needle and mark that spot where the calyx is like this okay yes yes now the next step is very important now you start palpating and if at that point the rib is directly there then you can't go there yes you understand that and that is what frustrates people immediately <laughs> yeah, i put my needle there but the damn rib is there we kya karna mujhe simple go down 1 cm below till you are under the rib okay okay now keeping the cm keeping the cm in the same tilt as you have it tilt the cm towards the tail end of the patient yes so the caudal tilt till this calyx is seen end on on your view yes you get my point yes so you are doing a combination of the two techniques yes now at that point you make a puncture Now you see my hand. Yes. See my hand. Yes. Your hand gets radiated. Yes. So to prevent that, you have to hold the needle in a forceps. Yeah. You hold the needle in a forceps. Watch it. 
and a little at a time start pushing your needle in. Put a needle in one centimeter, take out your forcep, again do a quick uh, uh, image and I mean quick fluoroscopy, put the needle in again and do quick fluoroscopy until your needle has gone where you think into the collecting system. If it's short of the collecting system, no problems. Yes. Sir. Now you turn your C arm, you're, you, now you're in the collecting system, okay? Yes, now sir. you tilt the C arm back again to the zero or even if you want 15 degrees to the other side. Yes. Why do you do that? Because you want to see that your needle has not gone beyond. Yes. If you had gone, gone you, your needle might be here. Yes. In which case you have to pull the needle back till it's here. Yes. But you try not to put your needle here. So that even if you are short, then you know have to go a little more. And you So the CRM has got a handle on the top. The handle is for you to operate. You do not allow the, you know, the technician to operate your CRM. Yes. Your hand should be on the CRM, moving the CRM right, left, up, down, depending on your preference. Yes. Also, the foot switch should be under your control. These yes. are two very important points. Foot switch under your control so that you do not over radiate and yes. hand on the CRM so that you can move the CRM on your own. Okay. Now you're aspirating, the dye has disappeared, and yes, you are in the right place. I wanted to discuss again here. Sorry yeah, go back. Sir, yeah. now in the, I, I use biplanar, the one which you have shown in the first, where you told that you keep the needle in the axis of the calyx infundibulum and pelvis. Then you move four finger breadth, uh, the, your hand palm breadth and two, two finger breadth lateral to that. Roughly, this is the only blind part in biplanar technique but we can keep wherever up and down little bit adjustable needle entry in biplanar that's that's after cool. that 45 degrees is your intellect you go in still kidney moves after that you use other angle and somehow you go perfectly into the calyx absolutely right you have said exactly whereas right. in bullseye the important point is the tract is little vertical but it decides scientifically where you have to enter from the skin but not the right spot because in a in in your in the way the bullseye technique is described in books yes. you go at the same level as the calyx if it may not be the right rib comes, sir, you, your skin rib, point may want to be a little lower caudal yes, yes sir if the rib comes the way you told then bullseye has to be adopted like again little biplanar you have to mix little bit Exactly. You told that one finger bit down means automatically your mind you have to readjust. The tract won't be exactly bullseye, but you are adjusting and going on to it one centimeter. Yeah, absolutely. So sir. you've understood that. Excellent. Yes, I hope that everybody else has understood that. Yes, sir. I obviously I'm talking to a to an expert. So I mean, <laughs> no, 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 no. Lot of people are there online. One hundred and eighty people are there online. Yeah. Uh, now let me talk about my technique or what you call the biplanar technique or the parallax technique. I use the word triangulation because textbooks mention triangulation. I don't know what the F they're talking about when they say triangulation. I haven't understood anything about what triangulation means. Sir. Okay. Now this is the same thing. You've got, you opacified the system. Now you put, I'm mean, here I put my needle all the way into the stone. But yes, as you said, you can stop a little short of the stone yes. or short of the target. Okay. Yes. So have you got that? Yes. Have you put your needle there? Now what do I do? In one now more I angle. tilt the CM this way yeah. to the foot end. Yes. And after tilting the CM to the foot end, I watch. I'm here tilting the CM myself. And yeah. see the needle goes towards the floor. floor. You see that? Therefore, yes, my needle is not in the right plane. It yes. is lying anterior, which means to the floor. Yeah. Am I clear? Yes, yes. Yeah. Therefore, what I need to do is pull the needle out, turn its axis, and push and it in. Readjust. And readjust. As you said earlier, I did this needle in so that you'll understand. But yes. I may not go all the way to the target. I will go short of the target yes. so that I don't puncture at all. Okay, yeah. and I make yeah. the puncture definitively for the first time, right? Yes. yes. Now I'm in the right position. This is a biplanar technique. Now look at this next position. 
I'm moving the Siam. I am moving it. I'm not asking this yeah. technician to move it. I'm particular about that because every 10 degree you wanted to see what's happening. Exactly. So I'm, and then you see this, that the needle and the uh, target are together. are together, regardless of the movement. This is what is known as removing the parallax. Yes. Removing the parallax. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not going to talk to you about physics or parallax. Let, I won't do that because people get confused. So yes. just let's talk. This is the important principle. Now, having understood this principle, understand this, that you can modify this technique any way you want. Yes, yes. All you need to do is put your needle and check in another plane, any other plane that you like yeah. and see and do the modified correction. So if you have a three-dimensional idea that at any given time you are seeing the image in two planes, and by seeing, by altering the plane, you will adjust for the third plane. That's all that CM is. It's no magic. It's no rocket science. It's very simple. Yes. Okay. Right. Fine. Now I want to talk to you about supracostal punctures. Yes. In supracostal punctures, this is one important image. You, here's your 12th rib and here's your 11th rib. Okay. The plural reflection usually goes horizontal like this. Yes. So, the higher you are in the intercostal space, the more likely you will go into the pleura. Yes. The lower you are in the intercostal space, the less likely you are to go into the pleura. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Going into the pleura is not desirable, but not a disaster. Yeah. Going into the lung is a disaster. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so sir. these are the two important principles. Now, what I would do is choose my calyx. If my axis is very medial, I choose a point a little more lateral. So again, I'm not in the ideal spot for that, for my landing site, but yes. I've chosen to compromise. Okay. Yes. Now, this is a very important slide. I don't find it mentioned in any of the books. The initial puncture is done in full expiration. Okay. Why is that? The pleura is fixed. It cannot change in position. Yes. The lung moves. Okay. Yes. So if I do the initial puncture in full expiration, when the lung has gone high up, the costophrenic angle has collapsed. Yes, and sir. if I put my needle through, it'll, if the pleura is there, it will go through two layers of the pleura yes, and sir. enter the subdiaphragmatic space. Okay. Now I'm safe. Now, that is the point. Once I have traversed the periphery and come into the peri, peri, you know, perirenal area, now I tell the person to give him a full inspiration. Yeah. The lung will come down. Even yeah. if my needle has gone through the pleura, there is no harm because the lung is safe. Yes, sir. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes, sir. And now the lung has come, and the kidney has come down. You are dividing the puncture in two parts. First yes. part will be expiration. First part will be Just be one centimeter you will go down. After that, you tell inspiration. By that time, your needle is away from the pleura in deeper Absolutely. Place. That is right. So that's, if you do that principle, you will generally be safe. Second principle, as far as possible, keep your upper tract punctures as small as possible in terms of the size of the nephrostomy, as much uh, as you uh, can. I will interrupt here. Uh, the the second point I want to ask, Dr. Mahesh Deshai sir is also online. Just now I have seen, I think he mentioned a, a point that shortest distance from skin to calyx, probably he might have mentioned this point in relation to the bullseye. In bullseye, uh, even if it is a vertical track to the calyx, it enters on the lateral part of the calyx, but it is the shortest distance. That's why upper calyx bullseye is applicable. You already mentioned. Yes. Uh, the second point, what I wanted to ask you, sir, if you if you are in supracostal, if your needle initially direct towards the foot end for one centimeter, and then a lip, little dip down to the upper calyx. That tract will become little oblique, but once the alkan rod is kept through a thick guide wire, then chances of pleura are injured less. What is your take on it? For example, many of the seniors who doesn't want uh, upper tract, they will travel a long distance from the uh, middle middle calyx to the upper calyx. That is completely criminal. Criminal. So yes. now it is not acceptable. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. Unacceptable. Ah. So I'll tell you, your point on the skin 
is you cannot change that. Once you have chosen that, that's why I said you go further down the intercostal space and you have less chances. If you go lateral on the intercostal space, the chances are you are missing the pleura. And you're almost eight out of 10 times, you will not go through the pleura. Right. I'm doing this breathing exercise only because okay, sir. two out of 10, you might go through the pleura. Yes, then I, I, don't accept, want to go through I accept it is above the 12th rib. Have you ever seen above the uh, uh, 11th rib? Yes, I have. Barely, yes, I have. You rarely have to take chance. Yeah, I have. I have you done have to above use the your maximum rib. brain. I have done it about the 11th rib and when you do that, this is very important. To puncture with the lung fully out of the view, that is on full expiration. And after you have punctured, then give inspiration so that the kidney comes down and you can puncture the kidney. Uh, and when you are withdrawing this kind of, uh, always see, uh, you know, where you have made the hole. Leaving a guide wire, withdraw your uh, scope so that you can see if you have traversed the pleura or not. If you have traversed the pleura, leave a nephrostomy for a little longer period of time so that it does not cause a problem later on. Okay, sir. So these are problems with that. Anyway, let me go on. Yes, sir. I just one point that Dr. Mahesh made, there's a very important point. They always say that you should have the direct skin to calyx distance to be the shortest. Not true. I'll tell you why. Your axis should be, and he would know because when he does sonography, he often sees a plane where the skin point, the lower pole calyx, and the pelvis are in one line. And when he does that, it is not the shortest distance between the calyx. Some is, obliquity has to be there. Yes, an obliquity has to be, and he's doing that because yeah. he's using ultrasound. So yeah. the same thing you have to apply when you're doing fluoroscopy. Yeah. Don't go at the same level if that's not a good level, because sometimes the anatomy will be such that if you go at the same level, you're angulating in order to go to the upper, calyx. Uh, uh, upper pole calyx. Upper calyx. You want to have the angle right, okay? Especially inferior calyxial puncture, if you go through the shortest distance, if it is a lower pole calyx, okay, if you want to go to upper, maybe it is... Yes, okay. yes, then your angulation becomes a angulation bit too much, becomes a, and their bleeding is a possibility, okay? Probably right. mentioned in relation to the bullseye. Okay, right. Thank you very much. That's a good right. one. Sorry. Right now, this is a supracostal puncture and you're doing it. No problems. You saw that two, two zones, one first expiration then. And remember, see, look at my needle, how it's coming. It's coming right from above. Yes, sir. All suprapunctal punctures should come from above. They should not be horizontal and certainly they should not be angled upwards. That's the most ridiculous way of doing a suprapunctal puncture. They have to be angled downwards, right? This is the angle. Sir, uh, I uh, I agree, but uh, sometimes it comes horizontal. Once okay. you crack the I'm dilatation, it be... goes down. See, yeah. as long as it is lateral, lateral and posterior. I agree with you. I'm just making the point. Because I see a lot of people who will do a track to the upper no, pole. Not like that. Not like, like that. this. Not, not like that. That is absolutely... Uh, not because not, length of the parenchyma transcalicial puncture that all will increase. Yes, as I showed you in the diagram earlier on, that will give you. Now this is a diagram from one of your textbooks. I can't remember which. It is a diagram to be cut out and thrown into the waste paper basket. Okay, <laughs> look at what this gentleman is doing. He is using a twenty-four French dilator, and from here he is putting a needle. What is his landing zone? His landing zone is here. This is the ideal landing zone. And he is using this landing zone. Yeah. So as a result, part of his tract or most of his tract may be here, which yeah. is not the ideal spot, which is because the, the mucosa of the collecting system but, is not firmly but, adherent. But if he dilates only 12 French and washes or makes laser, what is your comment? The compromise I'm going, is, I'm arguing, if, you, sorry? if you have to do something, you have to do it. But you know you have done something which is not right. Yeah. And you are doing a compromise. It is, is going in the opposite jugad. direction of the road for a short distance. Yeah, it is a jugad. And it may work, it may not work. Yes. Okay? So this is not acceptable. What Sir. is acceptable though is this. See, that's what I'm saying. Sir. Extreme angulation is perilous. You, this is the track you have to make. You can make it a little horizontal if you want. But you come from here, that is not acceptable. Not acceptable at all. Okay? Sir. Now see this. This is a patient on whom I had a complete stag horn. There was a whole lower pole stag and an upper pole stag. Yes, sir. 
when I did the original thing, I saw that the upper pole was above the twelfth rib. So I chose not to make a puncture there. I chose to make a lower polar puncture. I cleared all these stones. Then I'm angulating the kidney down by this amplat sheet. The kidney has come down one centimeter complete. Now I'm using my needle to go into this calyx. Yes. Okay. And so I have avoided doing a supracostal puncture because the supracostal puncture was very high. Okay. Yes, so this is the acceptable. This yes. is acceptable. But what that diagram which was there in that book, unacceptable. Okay. This is completely but acceptable. In this, you are using bullseye. It builds because it is a not lateral, not yeah, anterior a, a posterior, posterior pointing calyx. There is no anterior posterior harness. Exactly. Anterior you are calyx. Absolutely it right. Is lateral medial. If you go most laterally, maybe you are safe, and you will go vertically onto the stone in the most uh, shortest possible path. Absolutely. The only thing is that when you start manipulating in this kidney, you will find that this tract is getting angulated downwards. Yeah. Maybe at that time you want to remove your amplats so that only a guide wire remains so that the amplats doesn't cause any trauma to your lower tract. And, and second thing, it should not be nearer to the infundibulum at all. Yeah, yeah, because then it'll cause ambul it'll cause infundibular In bleeding. Infundibular and, bleeding. Yes, very important. That's why I showed you the diagram where the veins are directly underneath the mucosa of the infundibulum. And yeah. any kind of trauma to the infundibulum will cause traumatic bleeding. You have seen that in the old days. Of course, you guys have never done open lithotomies. But when we did open pyrolithotomies, we had a forcep called a Cabrini forcep. And we put that forcep into the calyx, grabbed the stone and wiggled it out. And as you wiggled it out, you tore the infundibulum and caused torrential bleeding. You understand that? I that's, understand, sir. That's the sir, sir one it? more relevant question asked by uh, Keith Gomes. He asked, he's uh, uh, non-Indian, it looks like, how to identify the posterior calyx, especially upper pole? To be honest, upper pole is a compound. Yes, there will be some common. medial, there will be some lateral, maybe some posterior component also will be That's there. That's why the upper pole is best done by a... Yes, because it's a large C. Yeah. It's a large C where you can hit somewhere. Yes. Uh, he is asking, uh, in the middle pole, okay, anterior, posterior, in, in prone PCNL, when you inject contrast, naturally denseness goes into the anterior calyx. Yes. Uh, whereas uh, in uh, post, in superior calyx, he is asking, do you apply the same rule that no. uh, if at all any posterior component is there, that will appear light? You can put air if you want. You air yeah. will float up. Otherwise, it is difficult in uh, superior calyx to say. Yes, I think calyx. use the bullseye. It is a good way of doing upper pole calyces. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. Fine. Can we go on? Otherwise, we we'll go yes, beyond sir. two hours. No, no problem, sir. No problem. <laughs> sir, right. this is a... Uh, uh, this is, a, I must say, still for the juniors, it is a once lifetime, they also will listen, who are listening. Total in and out people are 200, as of now 56 are listening. In and out are 200, people are already there online. No problem. Okay, now the second puncture. Whether you should put the second puncture sequentially or you should put it synchronously. Now, I mean, both are acceptable. A good idea would be to put a, do the puncture, put a guide wire and leave it there. But as I showed you in my earlier case, I might want to do some manipulation and I choose the easier access first and the, that access will allow me manipulation which will, which will govern how I put the second puncture. Therefore, I prefer not to put the punctures synchronously. I put them sequentially. I have no problem with the so that, uh, I, I, I wanted to contradict, sir, with my whatever 15, 16 I know, years of pacification is a and, problem and, in this. And we, uh, a pacification. A yeah, pacification that's a problem. Is a problem. But generally, and somehow, a... and somehow, the control when it is filled with the stone, the puncture versus no control when some stones are removed. Some Something when kidney is all filled with stones, you can confidently puncture two, three, and then get the wires in. But once it is half collapsed, uh, somehow either water distension doesn't happen, opacification doesn't happen, or stones will move a little bit. You will have little bit, especially supracostal and middle calicial punctures. As I told you earlier, I will never do more than two punctures nowadays. Yes, yes. So generally, it's one, one, one zone and far away the second zone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So two zones are all I'm going to puncture. So yes. the second zone, I can put a wire, no problem. But generally, there's a big stone in the second zone. 
Okay. So I can always go for the stone directly yes, with the sir. keyboard needle. Yes, so I don't sir. need to have access beforehand. But yes. if you do access beforehand, that's also perfectly acceptable. No problem. Okay. It's no problem. Okay. Sir. So I told you this. This is the reason why I might not do it. Now, white tracks. I've learned a, a lot of people talk about white tracks. What is a white track? A white track is a track where the incision on the skin is the same, yes. but the incision into the collecting system are two different points. Yes. The white track should always be in the same zone, never across two zones. Yes, yes. So they, I mean, uh, you cannot have a situation where yeah, you put a little track. puncture. Yeah, it's, it's two different calices because there are different calices in the same zone. Then yeah. you can wind the track, but yes, you cannot yes. have a track where you're, uh, you're winding the track between a lower pole stone and a middle pole stone. Yes. That not uh, it can get away with it, but it's not it's not the right thing to do. You might get bleeding as a consequence. Okay, okay, fine. Now, what has happened? All what I've told you so far was existing in 1984, 85, 86. By 90s, we knew all this. There was nothing new. Everything was already established. So, what has happened in the last 20 years that we've been doing PCNL? These are the things that have happened. Image guidance. There was a plan to make image guidance very, very automated. Uh, people in Johns Hopkins did a PACI system where they use a computerized system, but that didn't work out. And so image guidance has still remained absolutely the way we are doing it today yes. for the last how many years? 20, 30 years. The one thing that has changed is slender nephroscopes, therefore finer sheets. And that's a great advantage. Yes, sir. For many years, especially the Americans, kept on insisting, oh, it doesn't make a difference. If you good enough, good puncture, it doesn't make a difference if you dilate it to 30 or even 32, or if you dilate it to 20. It's the same thing. The patient will not bleed. Absolutely untrue. Even if your guide wire has gone perfectly well, the manipulation of that sheet in going to different calices will cause bleeding. The yes. narrower the sheet, the less bleeding. The smaller yes. the scope, the less bleeding. Yes. And these studies have been very elegantly proven by Muljipai right. Patel, by many of the work done by, if I'm not mistaken, Kukreja, whoever it is that has done that excellent work, has proven that smaller tracks, fewer tracks, less bleeding, better outcomes. Yes. Sir. So, so that is a lesson we have learned, and we are not going to change that. Yes, sir. Better fragmentation techniques. Now, we all started, I don't know if some of you may not have even seen the ultrasound uh, fragmenting probe. So we started with ultrasound, then we went on to uh, lithoclass or what we call uh, pneumatic, and then the uh, combination, which is called the lithoclass master or the cyber one or the shock pulse. Yes, These are all variations on the theme. They're not anything better. The great advantage, I'll come to is suction, but then we'll come there. Tubeless is a good advantage and we try to make uh, PCN suction. Now, this is a very important concept. If you are sucking at PCNL, you have two advantages. Stones come to your collecting, to the uh, stones come in to your, uh, uh, to the probe. I you see. don't wander all over the place. And as you, as you keep on breaking the stone, small fragments will get sucked out. And so ultimately you're getting a quicker result. Yeah. And suction for PCNL is an super and PCNL, yes, there are times when you will have to do super and PCNL, especially in a person with poor respiratory reserve, whom you will not like to put prone, and then you will have to do super and PCNL. So it's something you must have in your armamentarium. You must know how to do, you must have done at least four or five PC, super and PCNLs, so you are aware of doing this. Combination with RIRS, either synchronously or metachronously, which means whatever is remaining, you must be able to remove it with the RIRS, either at the same time as the uh, PCNL procedure or later on, maybe a few days later. Now let's go to nephroscopy and fragmentation. Let's first talk about the smaller stone. How much time do I have? I'm, I'm getting a... Uh, uh, sir, around 10, 15 minutes. Sir. Oh no, my no. God. So I better go a little faster than this. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about smaller stones. It's a simple, straightforward thing. These are the two gentlemen who miniaturized the scopes. Both their scopes are about... 12 to 13 French, the scope. This is the 12 to 13 French. And you've got sheets which are 15, 16.5, 21 in the stots. And you've got, uh, I think there are two sheets, 15 and 18 in the wolf. 
<clears throat> they are perfectly good systems and they work very well. And most small stones can be easily tackled on this. This is my setup for a mini PCNL. I have this sheet, which I was introduced to the sheet by my friend, uh, Dr. Wan from Zhuangzhou. And now I believe it's been, uh, it's become, uh, what do you call, uh, patented. So you have to buy the thing, but this was the original pre-patent uh, uh, design, which I had. And this is the uh, nephroscope. This is just an IP needle and this is a cheaper needle, okay? This is Dr. Janak Desai's uh, miniaturization. It's a 7.5 scope going through an 11.11 11 French, perfectly well, it works perfectly well, but it is limited to doing stones which are one to 1.5 centimeters. And these are very well accessible to RIRS in most cases. So I see it's a good technique wanting an indication, but it's an excellent technique when it works, works perfectly well. He uses a, a flushing technique where you flush from here, from this, and all the fragments come out perfectly good. This is Dr. Mahesh Desai's micro PCNL. The greatest advantage of this is it's a proof of concept. It's excellent. It is excellently proven that you can make a track as small as this and see and do something. Is it advantageous in stone surgery as we know it today? No, it's a question of diminishing returns. I think your returns are too diminished at this point with no great major advantage to the patient. And therefore, I don't think there is anything other than a proof of concept. It's very good to know that we can do this and someday this will be applied to some other access or some other uh, aspect of either urology or even non-urology. And therefore, it's a very good concept. Yes, sir. Suction during lithotripsy. Now, <clears throat> previously we should do suction through the ultrasound probe and everybody knew that. Then we had the lithovac. When we started doing pneumatic, we had a suction around the lithovac, litho, I mean ultrasound, uh, I mean the uh, lithoclast probe. Then yes. we had the lithoclast master. Yeah. Then we have shot uh, cyber. Have, have you used all these things? Uh, I've used all these in, in conferences, etc. But I'm at the present moment, I use Lithovac and Lithoclass Master, both. Okay. I've used the cyber wand and I've used the shock pulse in conferences, but I don't have it. Okay. Yes, There's even a laser probe with a suction outside. All these are very good. But when you start miniaturizing, what happens is that your nephroscope is becoming smaller and smaller. Yes. Now you have no way in which you can put suction through the nephroscope. Yes. Impossible. Yes. So then you have to put suction somewhere else. Yes. You have to put your suction onto the sheet. Yes. So that is this. This yes. is the concept by I told you, Mr. Van, Dr. Van, who is a Chinese gentleman from Zhongzhou, who's actually settled in the US. And I was introduced to these. These are 14, uh, 12, 14, and 16, three of them. Yeah. And I find they're superb. I'll yes, tell you now, just show you that. So, this is how it is. Yeah. One short dilatation, you put the sheet inside. There's a small slot here, which, yeah. like a Yankawa, if you press it, the suction becomes acute. Otherwise, if you don't keep the hole, the suction is mild. Yeah. So, and you can you can see this area, this area here. Yes. This is where the stone will go down. So, you do not have to take out the scope from the sheet at all. Yes. The stone comes out, goes out. You go back in, goes out, comes out, and you do not take the stone, you do not take the scope out from the sheet at all. Now you see this. Why is it not working? No, sir, you go back, sir. Yeah. I'll go back. Now uh, come down, come down, come down, and play it below. Is auto auto play or you have it, the play? No, no, it is click to play. Uh, it's not playing then. No, it's not playing. No problem, sir. So this not is playing. The, I mean, this has to be shown anyway. What can I do? You can go back to if the slides are less. Uh, 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 at the end, you can go go back to okay. your uh, your your computer and uh, where if you yeah, know sure where it. if you okay, know where fine. it is, you can do it. Later on, we will do it, sir. Okay, fine. So this is this is your track. Yes, and sir. This beautiful patient goes home the next day, yes, right? Sir. And you do not take out the scope at all. Yeah. Now for larger stones, larger stones, stones larger than three centimeters. This is my set in there. <clears throat> I have an ordinary wolf nephroscope, 
without the outer sheet. So this becomes a 17 fringe. Yeah, yeah. And is this Dredson? Dredson? Sorry? This is Wolf Dredson, uh, uh, standard Wolf. Standard Wolf. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's, it's called, the Bikini, okay. or I don't know what it's called. Yes, but you sir. can see that it has access to the she outer sheet, which I don't use. And I, I don't even buy the outer sheet. Have use any other scope because a lot of juniors will ask what scope I want to buy when I pass out my MCH. Yeah, now, now I'm so used to the scope, I have not changed. But if I look at the armamentarium, any scope which is 17 or less will be a good standard scope. Yes, sir. 17 is all you require. It is very good. There are only, uh, it's all Star and Wolf, only two Olympus are available. One has to choose among these. The machining of the wolf is infinitely better than the stores. Remember yeah. that. Yes, but sir. otherwise, uh, you can use whichever you want. Yes, I sir. only have four dilate, five dilators yes, and sir. one more. So I choose the sheet depending on the, the workload that I have. I have to make up my mind that do I want to dilate to 22 or 24 or just 20 and manage with that. So this is my setup. I have a needle. I have a cheaper needle, initial fascial dilator, Sir, five uh, dilators or six dilators. At this point, I ask you, if a large stone is there, honestly, something like Stagar, where predominantly it is in the pelvis, uh, you know that the 26 French will cause bleeding. But sometimes, after putting 20 French, uh, 18 French, you feel that absolutely no bleeding. You exchange and dilate up to a little bigger size, finishes the surgery very fast. Do you agree? I agree. That's why I said I've given the access. I've given two sheets here. And that's what I usually keep. On yes. rare occasion, when I go higher than this. I hardly ever go higher than this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The chiba needle is a very important yes. piece because you can always sound. You see, you must keep a chiba needle which is 240 millimeters. Your yes. IP needle is 200 millimeters. So the chiba goes 440, um, 4 centimeters beyond the... Beyond the... Okay, sir. Right? Now, in most of our PCNLs are being done for massive staghorns and uh, big stones. So I think you must have a concept of volume rendered images. And this is what I mean by a volume rendered image. Yes, sir. Again, the image is not playing. I don't know why nothing is playing now. Yes, sir. Oh, God. You play like this, sir. You play okay, like this. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. play this. You play like this. Yes, yes. Nice. Good. Thank you. See that? Now you can see this is the, how the kidney will look when I'm yeah, yeah. patient is in the lithotomy. So I want to enter this calyx and I want to enter this calyx. Yes. These two calyxes are anterior and they will right. let, see these are anterior calyxes. See that? Yeah. yeah. See yeah, how they are? And I want to enter yes, sir. the posterior calyx. There. Yeah, this yeah. and this. So, okay. Okay. Sir, one small question. In such a large volume, if you go most lateral part of the stone and hit the stone and do, most of the times you get away. Yeah, you I will do that only. I will yeah, do that, that only. Because there will be some effacement of the calyx my, and it will be dilated. Here and here. These are my two entry points. Yes, sir. These I will leave to see how I can do it. I'll show you that. More posterior and more lateral. Yeah. Right. So this is... I have. Chosen, these are the points I might have to access. Yes. These are my two access points. Now, dilatation, the metallic, amplats or balloon. I never use the curved samplats. I don't use the balloons, too expensive. I use yeah. the metallic uh, dilators only. No, no, balloon in India, nobody does. I don't know who is using. Uh, it's honestly. Balloon, no, nobody uses. Nobody uses. I usually do a lumbotomy, but now usually I'm making smaller tracks. So the lumbotomy is, what is important when dilating is the water sign. So you have somebody push fluid from the urinary catheter and yes. all through you must be able to see the water coming. If water is not coming, which means somehow your dilator or something has slipped off from the collecting system. Sir, this water comes after 12 French day, after you cross the 12 or 14. Yeah, it comes after 12 or 14. Uh, yeah. yeah, before 12 it won't come. The problem with dilatation is the under dilatation where you have not dilated because they have pushed the kidney off the dilators Sir. or chromatic dilatation when you have dilated in the wrong axis or you have dilated beyond the target. Yeah. Okay. Again, a problem that commonly occurs when you have done non-transpapillary punctures, infundibular punctures. Sir. Okay. 
problem with dilatation and adequate lumbotomy, the advantage of doing adequate lumbotomy is that you can get the feel of the kidney very well and your dilatation becomes much better. Okay, okay now I just go quickly through all this. You can from time to time do a little contrast so you know that you're dilating all the way into the connecting system. Yeah, yeah, important. Have a good first look. You should be able to see the connecting system and the stone. If you see something like this. Before you see the first look, first puncture needle when you remove, if the urine comes along with uh, uh, too much blood, will you avoid that even though guide wire is going into pelvis ureter? No, I will avoid that track. Yes, I will avoid part. that track. I will yes, change sir. the track. Yes. So somehow it has caused some larger blood vessel to be yes, Better to re. Now this is what it looks like when you push the kidney off the dilators. I'm sorry. And you can see the capsule. Yes, but sir. you are outside in the large cobwebs. Yes. And this is what it looks like when the stone is too large and it won't allow you to enter the system. You are almost in the system, but you are still just outside. These are venous sinuses here, and they will bleed if you take your scope backwards. Okay? Yes. Now, this is a lower polar entry. I can see the stone, but I can't enter because the stone is blocking my entry. It's only after I start breaking the stone that I will be able to manage to get my sheath inside. Yeah. Okay? Yes. So that's it. Sir, only one problem in this is if you break, one or two fragments will go outside the calyx and maybe there before you insert the access sheath. Before you yes. insert the sheath. That is sometimes possible, but your sheath is already inside, not completely inside. So don't worry, it should not happen. Yes. And my lower pole is cleared. This is the same case I showed you earlier. Yes, yes. The very same case. So yes. I angle it downwards and I do my next track. This is the upper pole puncture. Again, the system is completely filled with stones. So yes, I sir. cannot enter. I have to stay out and I have to start breaking to enter inside. Yes, sir. So we are through one hour, sir. We will uh, try to... Yeah, I'll try to hurry up. Yes, sir. Wait, I'll just show you this. Yeah, now these are the anterior calices. Yes, sir. This is the stone in the anterior case. Remember, I showed you that there were anterior calyx stones. Yes. Sir. I, I said I may not need to, right? I can see the stones going anteriorly yes, and yes, I can sir. puncture them. So from a posterior calyx, you can often go into the anterior calyx and remove the stone. That's just what I wanted to show you. Fine. And then you do an inspection and that's all right. Ancillary procedures, in case you have an inaccessible harpoon, I just go through this fast. You can, uh, uh, Encircle basket is a very good thing to have. You can put it into the collecting system and pull out a stone without having to access it. You put it into that system, into that calyx, and you can pull out a stone like this. Yes. But you can do a white track. So this is how I do a white track. So you pull out the sheet. You again put your needle in through. You use a chiba to hit the stone. Put your needle in, and you've got a white track. You yes. see that now? You've got a white track here. It should be in the same zone and with a little angle. Same zone. Little your, angle. your guide wire is, this is it. Wait a minute, laser pointer. This is your original track and this is the second track. You okay. wide the track and very close to each other so there's no real risk. Okay? Yes. Just a point about bleeding. Mucosal bleeding is very common in a large stagon. You, will, you, you keep on abrading the mucosal bleeds. Nothing to worry about. In front table of bleeding, I told you, if you try to put a large scope through an infundibulum, you'll get bleeding like this through the infundibulum. Yes, yes. Put an amplat sheet across it and don't worry about it. It'll stop. This is bleeding which is problematic. You see, this is a venous sinus which is bleeding. Yeah. And try to put an amplat across it. Otherwise, understand that it'll stop bleeding when you have repositioned the patient. Okay? Okay, sir. Fine. I'm almost through now. Clearance, check, okay. Whether you want to put a nephrostomy in every case, I would say I will put a nephrostomy, or I mean, put a stent almost in all cases. Yes. And I will put a tube very infrequently. Almost 80%, I will not put a tube. In 20%, particularly when I feel I might have to go in a second time, I will put a tube. Okay. The two techniques which you need to master, one is the Gardakau supine PCNL because it gives you access to the uh, lower track through a uh, through a flexible ureteroscope. Yes, sir. And you must know how to do a combined. You must have these two techniques in your belt. 
even if you do them very infrequently, still you must know how to do them because once in a while you will need to do them. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have exceeded my time. No problem, sir. Any questions, audience, please quickly make uh, comments in the audience. I will quickly go through the two, three questions and then we will close the uh, this thing, sir. Uh, the first question is, I appreciate the last slide. For last two years, I have changed completely to supine because I am uh, more into the RIRS. So large volume, I want to tackle both. So I have changed to supine. You mentioned that I am happy, sir. Uh, uh, in case of bleeding during PCNL in a peripheral center, not like in Mumbai, something imagine now peripheral centers are also well equipped. But if it is uh, now the sector urology is going into small towns i may say villages they are doing pcnl with a suitcase and a very good surgeon yes but once in a while he will get a bad bleed yes he bad will bleed yeah. what are the quick three steps you will take yes per operative if he bleeds massively during the procedure during the procedure only yeah, no, no, bleeding afterwards are also very yeah, sir, Afterwards, sir, oh man, oh, kuch to kuch kar lega. Yeah, he will be... <laughs> patient will die if he bleeds massively. No. Listen, during the procedure, you get across, usually there are three sources of bleeding. Sir. The parenchyma which you have gone through. Yes, sir. Bad puncture when you parenchyma on the other side. Sir. That means you have done a counter puncture on the other side. Like in a vein, you do counter puncture. You've done a counter puncture and you've injured the parenchyma on the opposite side. Sir. So, parenchyma on through the track, no big problem. You just have to put a larger tube or even put a, you know, put a large tube that is larger than the size of the track you have made. That will give you tamponade and that should stop the bleeding. Yes. If it is parenchyma beyond, then keep your fingers crossed, put a nephrostomy tube, clamp it and cross match blood, follow him up acutely. If you need to transfuse more than one point in the post-operative period, yes. he will need imaging straight away. Transfer him to a center that has uh, angio. angio. That is all. That's all. And the earlier the angio, the, even if it means that the angio is, I mean, he settles down, he doesn't, still, rather than wait too late My when he's lost a lot of blood. Yes. That, that answer is done, sir. See, some people mention that you just remove the ampulla sheath, press for some time and come out. Not at all. Put the ampulla sheath in. Keep them. Because remember, the bad bleeding is the bleeding which is beyond, which is non-tamponadable. And yes. that will not stop. No matter what you do, it will not stop. Okay. You understand? Yes, so sir. then you just rely on, as I said, keep your fingers crossed. Yes, sir. Because if it's, if it's yeah. not bad, it will stop. Yes, sir. Second question so, is... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, usually in Campbell, they mentioned that all supracostal puncture should be done X-ray chest in the next day. Not the next day. On the table. On the table. You must ask your anesthetist to vent ventilate properly and make sure the air entry is good. And then I usually get on the table, I get a person to sit him up a little bit and take an X-ray. Or at least on the floor before... He, Usually in the theatre, it's easier to do it before he goes to the floor. In all cases? All, all, Supracostal, all cases. All cases. All cases. And Just then. being safe. Yes. Better safe than sorry. Always. And last question. How many of the colon are injured in your 38 years of career? Three. Three. Is there any mortality in your PCNL surgery? A, B, two questions, last questions. Yeah. Um, um, as far as colon, three colon perforations, two detected at the time of surgery because I felt something was wrong. I withdrew the scope and as I withdrew the scope, keeping the guide wire in place, I found I was in the colon. I could actually do a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I put a big tube in the colon, I put a DJ in the kidney, came out and that was all that was required. He settled down. Second patient, something similar. The third patient was on the fifth day, he started getting a red sort of inflammation around the nephrostomy side. Put my nose to the nephrostomy, felt something funny. It wasn't the right smell. And then pieces started coming out from that uh, tube. So then again, I did the same thing, did a scopy, 
put a I could see the entry into the colon, put a wire down, put a big uh, tube into the colon, went into the kidney, put a DJ stent. That's all that is required. These are both were handled very, very efficiently without any access to open surgery. Yes, sir. I've had a worse scenario than that. I have had a duodenal perforation. Through and through. Through and through. It was, I won't mention that it was done by a, by a resident, but that's not important. Could have been done by me. It dilated, gone through the other side and gone to the duodenum. Luckily for me, appreciated what had happened and and called me at once as I think something's wrong. We did a dye study and we could see the duodenum being opacified. So what we did was we put a, a tube in the duodenum, but I did not take any risk of doing this non-invasion. I opened them up, did a gastrostomy, closed the duodenal perforation, and the patient came out perfectly well. Duodenal perforations are not you, something you... Uh, you, you should uh, not uh, neglect. Yeah, you, you, don't, neglect. you don't mess with them. You don't mess with them. They are yes. they're nasty buggers. Okay? Yes. Thank so that's you. about your uh, perforation. Uh, that's all. Great, sir. It is a, uh, it's a two, attended by 282 people. Uh, 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 somebody has asked the last question, how to... This is again Keith Gomes, uh, how to puncture calyx in a totic kidney. Uh, totic kidney means I probably... Yeah, yeah, I guess it. Yeah, yeah. Kidneys are, are more difficult than you can think. Yeah. They're very much more difficult because they're yeah. highly <laughs> mobile. Highly uh, mobile. Sometimes they're below the iliac crest. So yes, <laughs> what the hell do you do then? You have to put this patient in a head low, extreme head low. And with, with that and with the using the... Uh, respiratory movements if with a diaphragm when the diaphragm goes up the kidney will go up and that's the time when you manage to puncture the kidney yeah, uh, Alkin, sir, when came to hyderabad when he was asking how to puncture in a children or hypermobile kidneys he says that when you are toilet paper how you are when you pull it out it should be so fast that uh, the entire toilet paper should not come it should yeah, exactly <laughs> the puncture should be so sharp Yes. The moment you cut it, you get in and then stop you, there. You keep your needle ready and then but, but quick punch. jab and inside. So don't keep on pulling all the toilet paper. Then the he will go all over the place yes. and you will never enter. Yeah. Thank, thank you me. very much, sir. Yeah. So I I thank very much uh, the Chibar sir for taking good time. The amount of the energy uh, people say I, I talk uh, loudly, but you are one hour ten minutes. <laughs> fully energetic and uh, dear audience uh, i hope you all got benefited 290 who are watching tomorrow also don't miss uh, dr mahesh deshai sir is uh, giving talk on why a neurologist should know ultrasound absolutely important please everybody sir, watch everybody that it's very very important that too, we must all be we like, must all sir, experts in sonography yeah, who has dedicated his life for ultrasound predominantly likes that subject purposefully i've chosen so don't miss at 5 pm tomorrow let us utilize this uh, pandemic time, those who are not very busy because most of the India are now suffering. At least we can update our knowledge. So much today, uh, at least uh, in a nutshell, one hour, sir has put everything and everything in this uh, this thing. Thank you very much, sir. Great. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chandra Mohan. If everybody has picked up even one point, I'll be happy. Just one point, I'll be happy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir.